Good evening and thank you for this opportunity. The availability of modern technological diagnostic equipment has clearly raised the bar in the post-operative outcomes in patients undergoing cataract surgery today. And surgeons, without any doubt, no longer just anticipate but expect to deliver you know, un unfurring precision and predictability in their post-operative outcomes. And the reason this is true is because today we have with us tools and devices that help us capture and evaluate in great detail the status of the patient's eye, which thereby now helps the surgeon in deciding, in analyzing, in advising, and finally implementing in the most effective manner possible. I'd like to now share with you how the eye trace has completely revolutionized the way I look at my cataract surgical practice today. There is no financial interest, but a hell of a lot of interest. I now proceed with my talk. So having access to the eye trace, we are now able to understand the human optics with great and complete detail. It offers significant advantages in, in, because it actually measures separately and documents separately the aberrations that arise from the cornea, the lens, and the entire, in, and, and the entire eye as different values. So now the surgeon is actually be able to pinpoint where exactly the pathology in the eye is and also correlate the patient's symptoms with where the pathology seems to be. Moreover, and, and this actually gives him an edge in his eventual decision-making process. Moreover, the making, uh, you know, having a post-operative refractive surprise or some kind of a surprise because of the pathology at some other level of the eye which was otherwise missed now is almost never an issue. And therefore, today, in my opinion, an eye trace with an optical biometer offers an absolutely complete and comprehensive work patients for my cataract patients today. After you've done the, the general workup, you've done his refraction, you've checked his tear form, you've done a good clinical exam, we just go ahead and take a scan. The first thing you need to do is to make sure it's a visual centered scan because the difference between a visual centered scan and a pupil centered scan could give you a different level of aberrations. The importance of taking a mesopic span to me today, it's very important because this is the patient's own mesopic pupil size. And there's no way you're going to miss out on the aberrations and the symptoms that he is actually going through because in low lighting conditions. Uh, we then have a quick look at the refraction and after which we then go ahead and look at what happens to the refraction when you, when you, when you go down from two millimeters and enlarge the pupil to six millimeters. You look for the occurrence of night myopia and I do not know which other machine actually can pick this up. It is important because if the patient did have night myopia, he's going to be happy with the refraction you give him, but he is not going to be happy in night lighting condition because he has induced myopia. Now where this figures in, um, so, so what causes this night myopia is when the pupil dilates and more light goes into the eye, there's an induced spherical aberration. And this spherical aberration results in the patient being short-sighted in night lighting conditions. So just a quick look at that. And then when we look at the internal aberrations and the corneal aberrations, it's very important to compare what's going on in the cornea along with the lens. Because there is this thing called a lens compensation, wherein because of a biofeedback mechanism, the, le the internal, the lens, by making adjustments within itself, compensates for the astigmatism and the high order aberrations, which I will tell you in the next few examples. And then you, um, and, and oh, I'm sorry, you go back. And you can see that the E looks pretty good here. The internal optics E doesn't look too good. When you put them all together, the total, the total E that the patient sees is pretty good. And an eye like this, you would differ doing anything active there. I'll just take you through some first normal case and some interesting cases wherein, which is why I swear by this today. So this is a regular case of a patient who comes to you with an with a LOCS grade three classification like a NO3. He complained with some amount of visual blur and he had a visual acuity of 20 by 60. Uh, the first thing that we looked at is, the first thing that I always look at is what is the health of the cornea. Now once you know beyond any doubt that the cornea is good, bang, I know that now I can be happy to consider putting in a premium IOL. I'm not going to get messed up with an unhappy patient because of a pathology in the cornea. 
Once I've checked that the cornea is healthy, I go in and look at the internal optics and you can see a significant amount of internal aberrations which are largely responsible for the total high order, ab the total high order aberrations in the eye. Then I go in and look at the MTF curves. Now this tells me what is the status of the contrast. And if I can see here the corneal contrast at 10 cycles per, per degree is a good 60% and you can obviously see a significant drop in the internal contrast which again shows up in the total contrast of the eye. A quick look at what exactly the symptoms are like. The red is staring at your face, he's got starburst which is significant and they can't always depict what the problem is. By the, being able to understand what are the symptoms and quantify them, you know, we know exactly what the patient is going through. And finally, we come to the most interesting thing for me, which was the reason why I meet Ray every year in India and spend an hour with him at least. And then we come to evaluating the dysfunction lens index. Here, it shows a value of 1.92. So what is the dysfunction lens index? Um, the Tracy software measures the dysfunction in the lens and comes out with a figure. And that is an objective matrix, which is called the dysfunction lens index. It is the earliest objective indicator of qualitative loss in the quality of vision caused because of the problem in the internal optics. It is largely um, um, dictated by what's going on with the internal optics, but can also be affected or influenced by changes in the contrast, pupil dynamics, and to a certain extent, the corneal aberrations. And finally, you come to the opacity map. This again is an objective matrix which measures the energy that the retina receives when light passes through a lens. So again, you've got a figure here which you can actually quantify. So in this patient, we had a DLI of 1.92 and an opacity map to a grade of 4. And then a quick look at the aberrations. You want to ensure that the angle kappa is less than 0.5. That is the angle between the visual axis and the bag axis. You don't want too much of decentration. Any value more than 0.5 is going to cause significant photops dysphotopsias and all of these are the reasons why you do have unhappy patients. If you want to do an aberration correcting lens, you look at the corneal spherical aberrations as well. Finally, it also tells you which lens you want to choose and this is what you get and this is, if you, this is what you aim for and get in the post-operative period. You're a happy doctor and certainly an extremely satisfied patient. So that's for a standard cataract. The interesting, it gets interesting when you look, typically we have about 40% of our patients who come in with a very early cataract and he's got some symptoms and I would otherwise tell him, okay, you go back and come in in, uh, in about two or three months. So this is one such case. The patient has pseudo exfoliation, uh, NO3, LOCS grade, vision was 20, 20, 40, just a little bit of a blur. But when we ran the exam by him, we found the dysfunctional lens index to be as low as 2.36, which is what I, I didn't expect even in this case. The opacity map was not too bad. So this was a patient who presented with a dysfunctional lens syndrome. And what is a dysfunctional lens syndrome? It is a progressive loss of lens function in the normal natural lens. Stage one, there's nothing. You just have not too many symptoms, just to reduce focus veneer. A stage two where there's a further reduction in the focus veneer, but now you have some amount of internal optic aberrations, and these are the ones you want to pick up. You know, they have some amount of glare, blur, scatter. They don't have an obvious capacity, which is the stage three. Another, part, another thing that really interested me was looking at our PCOs. No matter which lens you use, which company, and no matter what they tell you, the chances of getting posterior capsular pacification do exist. The important, what I realized is, so I'll just explain this to you through two examples. This is a patient who presented two months later. He actually wasn't very symptomatic. He just came for his last follow-up visit, and he had this faint cellular PCO. And maybe he said, I'm all right, I'm doing well, and probably had a real bad cataract to start with. So they often compare what they were like to what they are now, and he was happy. He came with a visual acuity of 20 by 40, and in our country we call it 6 by 9. 20 40 vision is not when you would convene to consider yagging our capsules. But when we put him on the eye trace, we saw that he had significant blur and double visions, which were objectively seen, and the and the DLI was down to 5.2. There is no reason why the DLI should be even down to 5.2 in a patient who's otherwise happy with a very thin PCO. So we suggested, we, I decided to go ahead and yank him and after his, and if you can go back and see, you can look at the visual blur here because of this very thin cellular PCO. So then we went ahead and yanked him. He was back to 
a, a DLI of 10 and he said, wow, I'm seeing a lot better even now. So now I take you to another case, which is a patient who came with the same amount of vision. He came to us again with a 2040 vision, but now he had a significant PCO. Even in our country, even if we have a significant PCO, the patient is seeing 2040, we say, okay, you can hold on. But if you can see the DLI was down to 2.61, he had significant starburst and was very happy after a capsulotomy. Uh, this study is ongoing. I don't have the data today here, Ray, but uh, I have found now that visual acuity is no longer the benchmark or nor is the clinical appearance of the PCO for deciding when a patient should undergo a year capsulotomy. But it is the DLI because I can evaluate what is the drop in my patient's quality of vision. And that is what, I mean, and then again, depending on, I might want to wait till three months, but I'm going to reassure them that I'm going to make a little hole in the capsule and you are going to be seeing better because I know what the problem is, how much it is, and more, most importantly, where it is, right? Coming to, it's very interesting how it saves the day in our toric lenses that sometimes do go bad. This is an Indian lens, it's a smart toric lens, which is implanted in a patient. It is supposed to be placed at 0, 180, and clearly it is not. The patient had a residual astigmatism of almost two diopters, and if you look at the Chang analysis, you can see that the corneal astigmatism is somewhat uh, corrected by the uh, lens astigmatism, but there still is a significant uh, HOA astigmatism 0.2 in this patient and a significant manifest refraction of 1.87. We put the patient on the toric check and you could see here the corneal view front shows the axis of the astigmatism to be 57. However, the internal optics, the lens is at 74. And very clearly, it tells you what's going on and what you'd like to likely do and what you're likely to end up with. So we start with a manifest refraction of minus 1.87 cylinder. It suggests a 16 degree rotation, which would give you a change in the cylindrical power of 1.25, and you'd be left with a residue of 0.61. So we decided to rotate the eye. This is how it even tells you how to go about it, how many degrees to rotate, and what it would visually look like. Now, following the surgery is the case I did. Um, Again, you got the cornea, which didn't change at 54. Now my axis is at 57. It just said rotate by three degrees. We want to really be fussy to get that little more change in the cylinder. But if you see, I'm now left just with a cylinder, which was minus 1.87. Now I'm down to minus 0.3. The patient was extremely happy. I didn't go in and do anything else. He was 6'6 six, six plano and extremely happy. Now, it doesn't always work this way in toric IOLs. This is the patient who underwent a toric IOL implantation, and he was left with a manifest refractive cylinder of minus 1.25. You can see there's some amount of compensation of the IOL with the corneal astigmatism, but there still is a 0.173 micron uh, HOA astigmatism. Put him on the toric check. The corneal wavefront shows 119 is the astigmatism. The lens is at 106. And here it says 11 degree rotation, even if you did it, is only going to give you an improvement of 0.46. And uh, so even if you started off with a minus 1.25, you're not going to improve more than 0.08. So here you've really made a wrong choice in the cylinder. Coming on to, uh, this is what we dread most in our premium IOLs, is having a patient, you've done a great pre-op workup, you put in a multifocal IOL and he's not happy with his vision. And you've got 6'6 six, six vision, everything is okay, he's 6'6, six, six. there's no significant cylinder and you don't know what's going on. You tell him all is well and that's definitely what he's not going to accept and go home with. You put him on a map here, okay, you're relieved to see that the cornea is good, you haven't missed anything at all. And clearly you can see significant optical aberrations internally. And when you look at the e-chart here, it's clear that the visual quality because of the cornea is pretty good and most of his symptoms arise from something that's wrong in the uh, in the, at the level of the IOL plane. A wavefront map shows you a, a steepening uh, superiorly and a flattening inferiorly, which makes, signifies that it could be a tilted lens. When you then go ahead and reduce the scans to three millimeters and then to two millimeters, you still see the same aberrations because a tilted lens is tilted all the way. So however small your scans are, it's still going to show you the steepening up and, and, and that below showing you a tilt and you can go ahead and sort it out for the patient. Uh, here's a patient, both eyes, who's undergone radial keratotomy. Just a quick review. The cornea is pretty good. This is a 4RKI, and the patient's cornea is looking pretty good. 
you can clearly see that the problem seems to be more so at the level of the internal optics which show up as responsible for the high order aberrations there. And when you did the DLI in this patient, where you're expecting, oh, he's got, and, and in a patient like this, where you're confused, you've got an RK done, you don't know, you can see the RK marks, you can do the manifest diffractions, but you can't assess the quality of the vision because of the RK. And here you can clearly see that the Connelly is not too bad, but the big problem seems to be in the internal optics. And, the, and even though this grade is just one, the patient is is having a dysfunction and syndrome grade 2 and therefore would benefit from a cataract surgery. The other eye of the same patient, you can see the cornea is quite bad. There's a significant irregularity here. There's significant aberrations. He also has a cataract. But if you were to look carefully, there is a significant compensation at the coma and trefoil uh, with, by the lens of the cornea. It is negating that. And so despite this patient, with not so good a cornea, with induced internal aberrations because of the presence of a lenticular opacity. Since there is, a, if you look at the total E, the cornea not too good, the, the lens not too good, but together you've got a DLR of 8.52 because of compensation and you've got an overall E that's a lot better. You can now not only be aggressive in operating, you can be aggressive in holding back and just not operating because he's probably going to have his best vision by leaving him alone. This is my last case. Here's a patient with a post-LASIK cataract. You can see it's a, it's a post-LASIK who also presented with a cataract. Here you can see it's a very irregular cornea. The patient has got significant corneal aberrations. But please note, the lens with the cataract in this patient with the fired cornea post-LASIK has got significant compensation at 7 and 8 here with this resulting in a pretty good looking eye out here. And when you look at the patient's symptoms, he's got a lot of symptoms, but the refraction is still pretty good because there is some compensation going on. And here again, you can see the cornea is really bad, the lens not too bad, but the DLI is 5.3. It would probably be worse than this if there wasn't compensation. As, as you can see in the significant higher corneal aberrations that is also influencing the DLI here, the DLI would probably be worse would be slightly better if the corneal aberrations weren't there. So this is the other patient we also left alone. So I'll just briefly speak with you about the DLI study which we performed in India. Um, the main aim was to establish whether or not there was a correlation between the LOS, LOCS3 cataract grading, the vision, the patient's symptoms, and the DLI. The secondary objective was to assess and document whether or not there was any improvement in the vision the patient's symptoms, the DLI, the high order aberrations, and the MTF following cataract surgery. So 68 patients were presented to our outpatient department in the two month period between March and May of 2019 to our institute, that's Haji Bachali Eye Hospital in Mumbai, India, who are included in the study. The mean age was 58, plus or minus 10 years, 30 were males, 38 were females, 37 with the right eye, and 31 with the left eye. Eight patients presented with an early cataract and 60% had a dense cataract. The mean preoperative visual acuity was 0.83 plus or minus 0.49 and the cataract was scored as you can see here by the LOCS grading system. Post-operative evaluation was performed, I mean they did go through the day one, day four, but we did took the Tracy scans preoperatively and on day 15 and day 30. The scan size we tried to just limit in order to try and standardize after discussing with Ray at four millimeters because we wanted to, we wanted some standardized scan. A macular OST was performed both preoperatively and at each of the follow-up visits to make sure that we don't have new symptoms from uh, maybe at 30 days from the development of the CME. We were looking at clean cut cases. Any patient who presented with any ocular comorbidity or any pathology seen on macular OST were excluded from the study. Uh, these were the various tests a very dear friend of mine has very kindly used in the statistical analysis. I now present to you briefly our results. So the opacity was graded using the eye trace and the opacity grade score and the mean opacity was 3.5 with or without plus or minus 0 0.62. In all the different grades of cataract, it was the posterior subcapsular opacity that had a statistically significant correlation with the opacity grading by the eye trace of 
0.392. And this would Ray, you remember you said to me that when you have just a nuclear sclerosis and it's homogeneous, the light goes through easily. But we found, uh, to, to, co to, to corroborate with what you just taught me earlier, is that we found a significant correlation between the PCOs and the opacity grading. We also found a significant negative correlation between the preoperative vision and the DLI. So we looked at the visual acuity on logmar. As the vision got better, the logmar value got less and the DLI got better. So there was a significant negative correlation. But the negative correlation seen with the posterior subcapsular cataracts and the DLI was found to be statistically significant. Now what was interesting is the question I often ask that is it good enough to just do the DLI at week one? Is it good enough to do it at two weeks or is it or, do you, or should you do it? If, that was a question in my mind because I didn't know. We found that the DLI parameters significantly increased uh, the DLI from 3.18 to 6.7 at 15 days and from 6.7 to 8.43 plus or minus 1.76 at 30 days postoperatively. The DLI change between the preoperative and 15 days postoperatively certainly as expected was found to be statistically significant as was the change from day 15 DLI to day 30 DLI. My, we also found a mild negative correlation seen with the visual acuity means better the vision, uh, lower, lower the contrast drop. Okay? Mild negative correlation was found with the nucleopacity grade and the cortical grading and the MTF. But in patients with posterior subcapsular opacification, there was statically significant negative correlation that was seen between the PCO, P, uh, sorry, the posterior subcapsular cataracts and the MTF. A significant increase in the MTF was seen from preoperative postoperative, that is expected. The difference in the MTF was also significant at 30 days when compared to the preoperative, which is also expected. But we found that it was statistically significant difference between the TMTF function on postoperative day 15 and postoperative day 30. Okay, so the MTF is also improving from 15 days to 30 days. We found a positive correlation with the preoperative vision and the high order aberration, um, the high order aberrations of the eye trace. As the vision deteriorated, the high order aberrations increased. And at 15 days, again, we found a significant change, and the high order aberrations again continued to reduce as we went from 15 days to 30 days. The mean visual acuity increased from 0.83 to 0.18. So in discussion, we've operated on these 68 eyes. 60 of them had a dense cataract. The mean preoperative vision was 0.82 logmar. Most patients therefore did have a fairly advanced visual impairment at presentation. The opacity grading using the eye trace correlated well with the LOCS posterior capsular opacity grading. The posterior capsular grading of LOCS was found to have a statistically significant correlation with the MTF. The DLI and the visual acuity were significantly correlated, higher the acuity, more the DLI. The high order aberrations also had a significant correlation with the visual acuity. The visual parameters all significantly improved after cataract surgery, as did the visual acuity. The improvement in visual function continued to change significantly well beyond 15 days and up to 30 days postoperatively. The visual resolution is noted to stabilize in two to three weeks. However, the visual function continues to improve until much later. And therefore, some amount of continued follow-up may be required to determine the timing of stability for improvement in visual function. In conclusion, I'd like to say that the eye trace parameters, namely the DLI, the MTF, the high order aberrations, provide an extremely good assessment tool for assessing the visual function in patients with dysfunctional lens syndrome and a cataract. And the eye trace is found to be extremely useful in all patients with DLS to assess, evaluate, and plan therapeutic intervention, including cataract extraction, with eye implantation in these patients. I'd like to end my talk with this quote that says, a mind that is stretched by a new experience can really never go back to its old dimensions. Uh, I thank my colleagues and my students who have worked tirelessly with, tirelessly with me to get this paper together. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.